Hi, good evening, church. It's so good to have all of you connected with us. And, you know, it's really a special time as we are resuming our services. It's always good to have people here with us. And actually, we do have Pastor Roland and Life Fund's team here with us. And everyone here, can you just make some noise to the people at home and hear you <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Well, for all our viewers at home, do remember this weekend is communion weekend, so do make sure your communion elements are prepared and they're nearby you wherever it is so that you can easily access them at the end of worship when we go into the time of communion. But right now, why don't we come and prepare our hearts as we want to prepare ourselves to come and, and, and worship the Lord. So wherever we are, can I invite all of us to just stand up first? Let's all stand up both here and at home. And with that, let's join our hearts together for a time of prayer, just committing this entire service unto the Lord's hands. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity and this privilege to, to come and to worship you, whether we're online or we're on-site. Lord, we thank you for this great opportunity, and we want to give you all the praise and all the glory. We thank you that you invite us to your table, that you remind us of your great love that you have for each and every one of us. So Lord, we, we come filled with hearts of gratitude, hearts that are thankful, and hearts that just yearn to give you all the praise. So we commit this time into your hands. We pray that everyone will encounter you in such a fresh way, whether they're here at TC or back home. We commit this service to your hands. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 Come on, let's put our hands together. Let's, yeah. let's thank the Lord and let's worship Him. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. The Word of God tells us in Psalms 100 to enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Amen. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. So let's just give thanks to the Lord and give Him our endless praise. Oh, You are God, and we lift You up. We keep singing, we keep praising. We won't stop giving all we got. Cause You're worthy of all glory. Oh, there is no other. You are forever, Lord, over all. There's nobody like you, no one beside you. And to you, let endless praise resound. Every night and day, and with no delay, let endless praise resound to you. That's right. Boundless love, light before the sun, your glory eternal never stops. Giving all you got, creation keeps singing. Oh, there is no other, you are forever, Lord. Overall, there's nobody like you, no one beside you. Endless praise resound every night and day, and with no delay, let endless praise resound unto you. Let endless praise resound every night and day, and with no delay, let endless praise resound to you. Yes, we do. Praise. We lift you up, up, up. We're giving you our love, love, love for everything you've done, done, done. We give you all the praise. We lift you up, up, up. We're giving you our love, love, love for everything you've done, done, done. Oh, we give you all the praise And to you Let endless praise resound Every night and day And with no delay Let endless praise resound To you Let endless praise resound Every night and day And with no delay Let endless praise resound That's right Yes, we give you all the praise, Lord Hallelujah I will 
just lost a way with a broken heart You pick me up and now I'm set apart From the ashes I'm born again Forever saved in the Savior's hands You are more than my words could say I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days Fix my eyes, follow in your ways Forever free in unending grace Cause you are, you are, you are My freedom we live to higher Live to higher Your love, your love, your love Never ending war Oh, oh You are alive in us Nothing can take your place You are all we need Your love has set us free Whoa. And in the midst of the darkest night Let your love be the shining light Breaking chains that were holding me You sent your son down and set me free Everything of this world will fade Pressing on till I see your face I will live that you will be done And I won't stop till your kingdom come Cause you are, you are, you are My freedom we live to higher Live to higher Your love, your love, your love Never ending Whoa, oh, oh You are alive in us Nothing can take your place You are all we need Your love has set us free Whoa, Freedom, we live to higher. Say, you are, you are, you are my freedom. We live to higher, live to higher. Your love, your love, your love, never ending war. Oh, you are alive in us. Nothing can take your place. You are all we need. Your love has set us free You are alive in us Nothing can take your place You are all we need Your love has set us free Whoa. Give praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for you set us free. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. You know, church, the past few weeks we've been reading from the book of Exodus. And we hear the story of how God called Moses to lead the Israelites out from Egypt. And like Moses, some of us, we feel inadequate, you know, when God calls us to do something. But I just believe that the Lord is telling each one of us, just like He provided Moses, a helper, Aaron, the Lord says to each one of us that you are not alone and I'm going to give you a helper. And we all know that the best helper that God has given to each one of us to do His work is the Holy Spirit. So let's just open up our hearts right now and just invite His Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit to just come and just touch and minister to each one of us. And thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've given to us, Lord. Because you say in your word, your grace is sufficient for each one of us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, we bless you, Lord. 
What gift of grace is Jesus' my redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless grace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I.
in me is not high but through Christ in each one of us and the Lord wants to minister to us tonight the word of God promises us that that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you and the Lord is telling us that you know do not say that I cannot because you are so wonderfully and fearfully made and you can the Lord says just come before the Lord to just receive the promises of God right now lift up your hands and just receive the promises of the Lord now thank you Lord for your promises and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me who strengthens you and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. You are a living hope. Here I'm a city. Here I'm a city. Jesus, how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. That's right. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost his grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the 
the morning, there's still the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. The one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope here and online, whatever we may be going through, the Lord wants us to always remember that victory belongs to the Lord. And today as we worship the Lord of this song, what a, what a fantastic song for us to, to declare as we come to the table of the Lord. You know, before we go through this portion of our service, you know, the table of the Lord is such a special invitation. We are not forced to this table. We are invited to this table. The table of the Lord was, remember that, that last supper, that Jesus, knowing all that He had to go through, knowing that He would not be physically together with the disciples in that same manner, his desire was to draw near to them and for them to draw near to Him. And today we are being invited to come before Him, to come to His table. So I want us to just remember that about what a great honour and privilege it is. So today as we come to the table of the Lord, I'd like to invite us right now, here and back home if you're able to. Could you kneel? And if you're not a believer, just take a seat and just be with us in this moment as we observe this precious moment. For everyone here and at home, once you've knelt down, why don't you begin to prepare the elements that are with you. For those of you here, you can peel off the different layers. And those of you at home, just make sure you have the elements with you. And I'd like to invite us to hold the elements in our hands. As you hold them, whatever it is, I want you to know that what you're holding here is a symbol of God's love for you. 
It's not just a biscuit or some piece of bread. It's not just some juice. But it's a symbol of that precious love that God has for you and for me. This love that we did not do anything to earn it. We will never deserve it. But yet God chose to love us. Jesus says to all of you here, my son, my daughter, I love you. And His love for you is not because you've done this, you've done that. His love for you is not because you're so holy or you're perfect. The Lord knows all our shortcomings and He loves us in spite of that. That is what you're holding in your hands today. The thing in your hand right now is God's word to you. I love you. I'd like to give us a moment of just being quiet before the Lord and I'll give you some time to respond in your own way to the Lord. Thanking Him for His love, thanking Him for all that He's done in your life. And if there's any of us, we know that we're coming before the table of the Lord with sin in our lives that's not been dealt with. And we know that we must deal with it. We know that we do not want to come before the table of the Lord carrying this baggage of sin. Right now, confess your sins. And the Word of God tells us that He is faithful. He hears us. And He forgives us of our sins. So respond in your own way right now. Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed he took bread and after he had given thanks for it he said this is my body given to you do this in remembrance of me and in the same way after the supper he took the cup and he said this is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me Lord, we thank you for your body that was pierced, your body that was crushed for our sake. Lord, nothing we can do will ever repay that. But we come before you humbly to say thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your body that was broken for us. Let's partake of the bread together. Thank you for this cup. This cup that you have told us is a new covenant. Lord, this cup that does not condemn, but this cup that saves, that shows us how miraculous and how wonderful you are and how amazing your love is for us. So Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us on the cross. We know because of that, there's no condemnation, but there's salvation, there's freedom in your name. Thank you, Lord. Let's drink this cup together. The Word of God tells us that whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, 
we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We proclaim this because the cross does not mark the end, but the cross marks a fantastic, a beautiful beginning for each and every one of us. Because we know that while Jesus died on the cross, three days later, He defeated death, He defeated sin, He defeated that cross, and He, he rose again on high. And because of that, that is why we have hope. That is why we sang that song and we declared that He's not just any kind of hope. He is our living hope. He is alive. He is here with us. He is with you every step of the way. So Lord, we thank you for this. Church, whether we're here or at home, why don't we stand and we're going to continue to proclaim this hope, we're going to proclaim this victory that the Lord has won for us because that is such a beautiful thing that we want to tell the world about. So let's stand and let's worship the Lord. Then came the morning and that silver promise your very body began to breathe out of the sun on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. I must declare that again. My Everyone, lift up your voice. Hope. Lift up, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Come on, give him all the praise. Lord, you are our living hope. Amen. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. You are high. You are lifted high above everything Hallelujah. else, Lord. Praise you, Lord. hope that you have given to us. And Lord, we know that many times in life we go through situations that are seemingly hopeless. But today the Lord says this to you. He is your living hope. 
you just as we sang those words, God, you are my living hope. I think there are many of us who need to declare these words in our own lives. Because sometimes we, we think that this hope is for someone else. It's for that person. It's for the pastor. It's for my cell group, my cell leaders. For, it's for those of us in church who are the very holy ones. Those who are very... Oh, no, this, this hope is for all of us. And today the Lord says, He is your living hope. Thank you, Lord. Church, we're going to spend some time in prayer right now. I think we all know that this weekend we definitely must be praying for the entire COVID situation here in Singapore. We are thankful that things are not in a severe situation that we have to worry or panic about it, but yet we know that there are concerning situations and I did receive different reports. I know of different churches who had to suspend their services. I do know of different uh, people around who are, who are under quarantine orders and, and all that. So, we have to be cautious and we definitely must remain spiritually vigilant and alert. We want to continue to pray through this entire situation. So we're going to pray uh, over this. But I'll just let that one specific area we want to pray for are all the healthcare workers. I know we read about the whole uh, cluster that's formed at uh, Tan Tok Seng Hospital. Not just that, I believe today, just a couple of hours ago, there was an article that came out that said... Um, uh, I think Singapore General Hospital and Sengkang General Hospital are something like that, that capacity. They're just overwhelmed by A&E cases and everything. And I mean, all this while this situation is uh, happening, I think we really want to pray for all the healthcare workers. And if there's any of you here at TC and you know someone here is a healthcare worker, I mean, later on during the time of, of prayer, just pray for that person. If any of you are back home, um, you know of a friend, someone you may not be with that person, but specifically pray for that friend or that family member you know who's a healthcare worker or if in your household there is a healthcare worker, make sure you take this time to come and pray for them. I just, I just feel that we want to, to speak a, a word of blessing upon them. There was also an article about how the healthcare workers were saying that, I mean, it is a stressful situation, especially those at Tan Tok Seng Hospital, but yet they are prepared for that. They know this is part of their job, it's part of their calling. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's such a, a, a noble thing to hear that them saying that. It's, such a, it's something that I'm so amazed by and we want to ask for the Lord's double portion of anointing and of blessing and the Lord's protection to be upon them, of course. So let's spend this time in prayer. I'm going to count to three. At the count of three, as always, we declare hallelujah three times. We're going to pray through the whole COVID situation. Let's ask for the Lord's protection upon our nation uh, as people are going out and about, as different services are happening, different uh, uh, religious organizations are still having their own uh, worship and different groups are congregating. Let's ask for God's protection upon the entire nation. And then let's pray for the healthcare workers. And like I said, if there's a healthcare worker around you, make sure you, you take this time to pray for that person, all right? So I'm going to count to three. At the count of three, let's declare hallelujah three times and let's begin praying, all right? Ready? One, two, and three. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and hallelujah. Let's pray right now. We can pray in tongues. Let's pray in English. Let's come and intercede for, for our land right now. Oh, yes, Lord, we lift up our nation to you, Lord. We thank you that you've been watching us for this entire season. Lord, we thank you for all that you've brought us through. And we know that as we come to this junction, we ask for your wisdom, we ask for your praise, we ask for your mercy, Lord. Watch over us as a Watch over every single person that are coming and they're going, the students in the schools, the people who are at work, are, are, are helping you wherever they are, all in the midst of their own daily lives. Lord, so many times that we come, we ask for your protection to be upon us. Lord, may the God of Jesus come and come and stand. Lord, 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 wash over us. We know that the past year has been a very bumpy time. A lot of ups and a lot of downs. But Lord, we come here before you and we say, 
thus far has the Lord sustained us. Lord, you have brought us to this place and we ask for you to continue to watch over us. We cry out for your grace and mercy over us as a nation. Lord, watch over us, protect us. We know that there are a lot of things going on. There are a lot of vulnerable groups out there. There are schools, there are students, there are elderly, there are families going out and about. There are different groups uh, coming together in, in, in different religious organizations and so on. Lord, we cry out for your protection. Lord, we know of different churches who have been directly affected by this as well. Some of them, they've been suspending their services. Lord, we ask for your, your, your hand to be upon them and we specifically want to pray out for wisdom upon their leadership to know how to handle uh, this particular season that they are in. And Lord, right now, we want to pray for all the healthcare workers. Lord, whether they are, they are in our midst now or whether they're in the church or not, Lord, we pray for all of them. We ask for your anointing that as they choose to serve, as they choose to, to, to lay down their own rights, Lord, we pray that they will be blessed abundantly. For all those affected at the, the Tan Tok Seng Hospital cluster, Lord, we know that there are a lot of worries uh, about spreading to their families and everything. Lord, we pray for protection. We pray for uh, protection not just on them, but on their family members as well. We speak your peace into their families. Lord, we pray that as they continue to, to, to look after their patients, Lord, their patients will recover. Their patients will, 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 will just have a... Uh, um, uh, recover in a way that they need to they will get the care that they, are, they need from the nurses, from the doctors, from the different uh, healthcare professionals there we pray for all of them over at Singapore General Hospital, at Sengkang General Hospital as well, but Lord we know that things are, are, are very stressful, things can be overwhelming at times, but Lord we know that you will sustain them, so we speak all this blessing upon them, we cry out for them Lord, and we ask for your blessings to be upon them Lord, we declare all these things and we pray knowing that you hear us. We pray knowing that you want us to come before you in, in, in prayer and petition. And Lord, we ask all these things in your name. Lord, we pray that everything will be done according to your will because you are the sovereign Lord. So we thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Can we just praise the Lord? Can we thank the Lord? We know He hears our prayers. We know that, that He loves our land. Lord, we thank You for hearing our prayers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise You, Lord. Well, you know, it's always such a fantastic time for us to come together and now we're resuming in small steps, but it's great for us to come back and have people here worshipping the Lord and praying together with us. And now, uh, before we move on to the next segment of our service, we just want to uh, just... Uh, greet, at least for all those of us here, we just want to just say hi to those people back at home. I know we, you all can see us, but we can't quite see you. But nonetheless, I think it's, people have been saying it's always nice to see people back here. So we're just going to do this. In a moment's time, we're going to do our standard wave to each other. All those of you at TC over here, the cameras on my right is that black thing on the wall right there. We're gonna, I'm going to count to three. At the count of three, we're going to wave at, at the people back home. And we're going to say just something very simple that we always say. We're just going to say, God bless you. Okay? And people back home, you're going to say it back to us. We will, of course, we receive your blessings. You're going to take a video or whatever it is. It's up to you. But we're going to greet one another, all right? So I'm going to count to three. You look at the camera on my right there. And we're going to wave. Put on a big... I know you can't see your, your mouth, but you can smile with your eyes, okay? So put on as big as smile as possible. Okay, wave. And we're going to say, God bless you. Already? One, two, and three. God bless you, all right? God bless all of you back at home. And uh, I know some of you are saying it as so well. We receive it here. So before you're seated, everyone here, just turn the sign beside you and say, so good to see you. And if you're back home, you can be seated as well. Praise God. Well, we've come to the portion of our service right now where we want to continue worshipping the Lord through the giving of our tithes and our offering. So as we've been mentioning to everyone, we're still giving through our digital means. So you're going to see all the information up on the screen right now. As always, we've got our two QR codes that you need to scan with your respective banking apps. One is the one in the red border is for our regular tithes and offering that go into our general fund, while the one in the blue border is for our missions faith pledges, which is over and above our regular giving. And uh, that goes for the purposes beyond our, our own ministries, but for the sake of missions and other ministries around the world. And if anything, if you have any difficulty with that, you can head over to that URL on the screen and all the QR codes, all the different... Uh, resources you need are all available there. All right? So as you give to the Lord, why don't we come and join our hearts and commit this offering into the Lord's hands. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have to give to you. And as always, we declare that giving to you is an act of faith. That we give not out of 
compulsion, but Lord, because we want to worship you, we want to bless you, and we give out of faith, declaring that you are our provider, that everything we have belongs to you, and we give to you. Whether, whether in, 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 in plenty or in one, Lord, we choose to give to you because we want to honour you. We pray that this offering will be used for the furtherance of your kingdom here in Singapore and around the world. We thank you. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. Well, God bless you as you give unto the Lord. And if for some reason you're unable to get it done right now, just remember this platform is available uh, at any time, so you can do so later on as well. Now, as we are you're giving your offering, just two announcements for us to be aware of this weekend. Well, first one is a repeat of last week's announcement on our annual general meeting, which is going to be held on the 12th of May, 7.30 p.m. at Touch Centre. Now, if you would like to collect the annual report, it is available upon request, okay, either through a self-collection here at TC's information counter, or it can be delivered to you at, a, at, a, at your own cost through a courier. And if you want to request for the annual report and or you want to register to your attendance for the annual general meeting, please fill in the form found on the website on screen, which is fcbc.org.sg slash AGM2021. Please do so by this coming Friday, which is on the 7th of May, 12 p.m. Now, both the attendance, both the AGM itself as well as the report is only available to registered members. And due to the entire pandemic that's going on right now, we do have to limit what, the capacity of any on-site events here. So that's why we do need you to register. We do need to, you to get a ticket. And if there's requirements for us to open up additional venues, we will do so as well. So make sure you go ahead and uh, head to the website and register. Now, the second one is going to be uh, basically an online parenting workshop, which is called I Can't Live Without It, or I Can't Live Without IT. Basically, it's for uh, workshops for parents, uh, caregivers, or leaders with children or youth aged between 7 to 16 years old. And the whole idea here is from our Family Life Ministry, where our aim is to teach us how to better understand and engage our children or our youth in the area of uh, screen usage, uh, internet, and gaming habits. And it'll be a Zoom uh, seminar, I guess. Uh, it'll be held on uh, 22nd of May from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. And the speaker we've invited is uh, Galvin Sung, who is a senior family life educator with Touch Parenting. If you'd like to register, please do so by next Sunday, 9th of May, and the URL is on screen, fcbc.org.sg slash I can't live without IT. So do make sure uh, parents and uh, any of the leaders, if you're interested in this, please do make it a point to go there and I believe it will be a great time for you. So those are all the announcements I have for us this weekend. So with that, let's uh, come and receive the word of the Lord. Now, actually, before I come and uh, share the word I have for us this weekend, well, I would just like to make some uh, comments on a lot of the discussion that's been started over the last two weeks. And I, this will be the probably final thing I want to talk about this, but I do think uh, different people have been talking to me and so on, and I do want to just express some of my sentiments on this. If some of you are not aware, um, it's just interesting how a particular issue such as uh, ripped jeans can cause such uh, ripples. Someone said to me, it's interesting that, you know, it's been a long time since the sermon has caused such hype around. In fact, last weekend's sermon has made it uh, overseas, has made it to other churches as well. Another pastor contacted me and commended me for being uh, very brave to tackle a situation like that. And when I hear it, honestly, I find it very interesting, I find it very amusing, and I find it exceptionally sad at the same time that uh, this is where what, what has come to in church culture at large. Well, I think a few things I want to say first. Firstly, I want to thank people for their overwhelming support that many people sent in about your appreciation in addressing the issue of the heart and the mind. And like I mentioned last weekend, whether it's this ripped jeans or any other thing, okay, it's, it's not about that particular issue. It's really about the issue of the heart and the mind. Secondly, I want to acknowledge uh, a lot of people who also wrote to me who, interestingly, I also stepped forward to share their own encounters here in our own church. And I heard of people who wrote in to me and they told, they, they told me about their own encounters of legalism in our church, which is why it's important to address that. You know, they, I, I hear about how some of them had staff, leaders, or volunteers who enforced certain standards or certain rules in a very legalistic manner. Uh, interestingly, some, someone told me that uh, 
when they went for consolidation duty and they were not in the appropriate attire deemed by the person in charge, they, were actually, they actually had to go and buy new clothes before they could report for duty at, the, at that very same time. Uh, someone else told me that uh, this person also was addressed by someone and told to fold down the jeans pants uh, because it was folded too high, revealing the ankle. And uh, I've been just been hearing all this, and uh, firstly to all these people, I really want to, I do apologize that you have had such an encounter here, and I do thank you for hanging in there. The third thing I want to say is something that different leaders have been engaging me on, and people have been saying, you know, Pastor, we can, we can, we, we understand what you're saying, you know, but I think one of the big concerns that some people had was uh, a seeming disparity in certain standards because a large bulk of the concerns is that the dress code in the church doesn't seem to be standardized across the board from the worship team to the team pastors and so on let's just talk about this weekend itself it's holy communion those of you who have served in uh, the holy communion team before you're required to wear formal wear for the guys uh, dress pants dress shoes dress shirt and i think a tie as well uh, but you look at that, not, don't even talk about the worship team. Our staff, our pastors are not even in such uh, formal attire. So um, there's some disparity there. Well, actually, we've been revising this for the last couple of years, and I think some aspects simply have not caught up. Some aspects just simply have not been updated, and whatever has been updated, well, to be honest, the last one year plus, we've also not had on-site services to see the changes in place. So on re with regard to this kind of disparity, I really have no qualms apologizing for that. I think that should be definitely be always done better. But finally, what I want to say about this whole issue, I will apologize for the bad experiences that people have had in the church. I will apologize that things have not been updated in the way it should have been. Uh, but I will not apologize for the message I've brought. I will not apologize for my convictions. And I will not apologize for the direction that I would like to set for this church. Last week, during the week, I spent the week reflecting on this statement made by Martin Luther King Jr. It's an adaptation of something he said in his uh, I Have a Dream speech. He made a statement. He said, I look to a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Obviously, MLK Jr. was speaking about the issue on race, but I think this statement is relevant for the church at large as well. Racism, of course, is a much more severe issue for sure, but whether it's racism or this dress code issue, it stems from a certain level of superficiality in our lives. A lot of it comes from valuing tradition over truth, valuing personal preferences over God's priorities, and yes, the ramifications in racial issues may be heavier, but yet all these things reflect on the conditions of one's heart and mind. And so what I want to say is this, at the end of the day, I too have a dream. I dream that in the church of Jesus Christ, that God, and especially here in FCBC, this church that God has called me to lead, I dream and I look forward to that one day, there will be a people that will not be judged by what's on the surface or what's on the outside, but by the content of our character. So that's something I've been reflecting on, and I know some people wanted to, uh, I've been engaging a lot of people. Honestly, some people, I know you feel like, well, out of the blue, where did this, all this thing uh, come about ever since Pastor Wilong started it? Just so you know, a lot of these things we've been in conversation for the last five over years already with different, engaging different people in private settings, in smaller settings, but it's getting so out of hand. That's why, you know what, I'm just here to settle the score once and for all. So that is... That's the final thing I'm going to say about this. We can discuss more of this uh, offline, but like I said, that is where I stand. So with that, now I'll jump into this weekend's message, which is actually something I've been thinking about for, I guess, a couple of, of weeks already. And I think it's, um, I don't know, maybe I feel like it's extra relevant during this time because of uh, the digital age we're in. And I guess the whole COVID uh, situation has kind of accelerated our everybody's foray into the digital space, whether it's social media and whatever, you know, people who never quite uh, did any kind of teleconferencing has gotten into it. So a lot of things have changed. I, I, I want to talk to us about the topic of comparison. In life, we tend to compare ourselves, we tend to compare things to a lot of different things and diff different people around. And so I'm going to read to us a few different sets of scripture uh, that we'll be looking to here and there. I want to start off first from Genesis chapter 4 verses 3 to 8, just a couple of verses here. Uh, it says this, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. 
Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were out in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. I believe this is one of the early examples of some level of comparison in people's uh, lives between Cain and Abel. I will now jump to the New Testament. We're going to look at Luke, just one verse, Luke chapter 22, verse 24. And it talks about the disciples. It said, there was also a dispute among the disciples as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Now, I want to bring us to 2 Corinthians. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. These are the words of... Um, of, of the Apostle Paul and how he was addressing a situation where he was being compared to some other false prophets and some false standards that were out there. So 2 Corinthians 10, 12, he writes this, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves, means they use themselves as a standard, and comparing themselves among themselves, they are not wise. Basically, he's talking about this whole aspect of comparison. He says, if we do that, then we are not living as wise people. Now, everything I've looked through, there's a lot of other examples that some of it will go through in, uh, later on as well. But comparison is something that is, well, it's, it's innate. It's, it's part of us. That's why even in Scripture, we see how that comparison exists. You know, I think many of us, since young, we are... We are exposed to a culture of comparison. There's a lot of comparison that goes on in our lives. The moment we go to school, there's a lot of comparison. Or even as a young, as a as a as a young child, you know, parents sometimes will compare their kids. You know, who go who go which school, who's doing what. You know, who who scores more and everything. There's all this level of comparison that exists around us, and we often think that it's something that that uh, starts off when we were children, when we were younger. But you know what? This whole spirit of comparison it can stick with us all throughout our life. And whether you're young or you're old, there are people who are caught up in this whole atmosphere, this whole mindset, this whole spirit of uh, comparison. Now, I don't know if some of you are familiar with this. Um, I guess those of you here at TC tonight, you might be more familiar with this. Uh, there's this rather wholesome meme that's been going on for, for quite a long while already. Like it's, not, it's not exactly very new, but it's actually taken from a scene uh, of this show, of, of this comedian called Louis C.K. Now, Louis C.K., he has this uh, uh, comedy, drama kind of thing where it's a dramatized version of, of his own, his actual character. Uh, some of you may have seen this. It's about his struggle. I think he's a divorced character and he's got, uh, he's got two daughters with him. I know it's a bit hard to see here, but i just show you so that some of you may have, may have seen it before, you may have referenced it. Uh, but it's a, it's a very interesting scene. What happens in this scene is very simple. He's in the kitchen and one of his daughters, okay, goes up to him and says she wants a mango popsicle. And the father says, no, this man, there's only one left and this is actually set aside for the other sister. I mean, there's a prearranged thing already. And this daughter keeps on going that it's not fair. It's not fair that how come she has this and how come I don't. And she goes on and on and the father basically tries to teach her about it, tries to address her, but she keeps going that it's not fair. Okay, because why does her sister get this mango popsicle and she doesn't? And they keep, she, she's not listening and finally the father bends down to her to try and teach her something. All right? And one thing he says is this, you know. He says, the only time you should ever look into someone else's bowl is to see whether they have enough or not. You should never ever look at someone's bowl to see whether you have what they have. I paraphrase, but that's along the, the line. You can find the scene on YouTube and everything. It's, it's, it's something very powerful right there. Okay, of course, it being a comedy, there are some other funny moments in that scene as well. But yet, it does not steal the importance of this life lesson here. That in life, everyone is very accustomed to comparison. It's not fair. Why does this person have that? Why do I not have this? Why is this person like this? Why am I not like that? Or why, why this, why that? There's a lot of comparison right there. And that's what makes it a very meaningful scene. And so, the message I have for us this weekend, I've called it, the comparison trap. A comparison trap. Comparison is something that exists all around our culture, all around our society in life, and it's a trap that many of us fall into, and I call it trap because some of us, once we're trapped in it, it's very hard to get out of it. 
We start comparing every single aspect of our life. Everything is a comparison. You versus someone else or their situation versus you or your scenario versus another person's scenario, your family versus another person's family. There's all these kinds of comparison. But I believe that, that by the grace of God, He gives us the means to be set free from this trap so that we don't have to live a life trapped by comparison. Today, I want to share with us two ways that comparison affects our lives. How it affects our lives, how it changes us, how it, it, it shapes our mindset, our attitude. The first thing I want to share is this. Comparison feeds self-centeredness. Comparison is something that will feed self-centeredness in our life. Now, what is self-centeredness? We often would think self-centeredness refers to being very selfish. Well, not quite. Self-centeredness basically means is this. It's a mindset where everything centers around oneself. It means if I'm a self-centered person, it's not just that I'm selfish. It's not just that I don't like to share things. But every situation, everything must seemingly revolve around me either my preferences, my thoughts, the way I want it, or my impression, my emotions. That's what it means. And there's this thing that happens right here. Comparison feeds this self-centeredness, where everything revolves around us. And so it can easily give in to this sense of comparison that brings about a sense of superiority. See, that's one aspect of comparison. Sometimes we can compare in such a way that I feel superior to somebody else. I compare myself with someone who has less or who is not so well to do or whatever, and I feel superior about that. See, there's, there's, when, when we talk about this, right, it's that I'm taking someone else and comparing it to me, and I am the standard. So I'm saying, oh, you know, this person is not as, not as good as me, not as fast as me, not as whatever as me. And the truth in life, right, is that some of us, we do, or in fact, many of us, we have a certain element of this in our life. Because the truth is, everybody wants to be superior. Okay, I'm not saying that we're exactly very arrogant about it, but everybody wants to be better. I mean, if you have a, I mean, it's quite obvious, if I give you a choice, you want to be fast or you want to be faster? You will say, I want to be faster. Okay, you want to be good or you want to be better? I want to be better. We all want, we all want that, that to be superior. That is part of our life. And it's really human nature. If we look through scripture, it exists there. Remember just now we looked at that verse from Luke chapter 22, verse 24, just that one verse. The disciples, these were the disciples who spent all that time with Jesus. They were being discipled by Jesus. They received teaching directly from Jesus. Yet in verse 24 of Luke 22, it says, there was a dispute. Not a discussion, not a conversation, a dispute. A dispute is an argument. In fact, it's a, it's a, strong, it's a relatively strong word. There was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Meaning that, I imagine this, you know, that when they, this, was, this actually happened during the Last Supper, that when they are there, right, it's not just 12 disciples or whoever they are sitting there and say, hey, guys, who do you think is the greatest among us? I don't think it's like that. It's, it's a dispute. There's probably raising of voices. There's an exchange of, 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 uh, of certain uh, emotions there. So it's, it's a dispute. It's an argument. And they are arguing about who is the greatest when Jesus just wanted to spend time with the disciples. He wanted to, to, to draw near to them. He wanted them to draw near to him because the next day he's going to be uh, uh, crucified already. But here they are comparing themselves, trying to determine who is superior to the other. Honestly, when I look back at this, it's, it's almost like they're a group of children. A group of children, you know, when you have a group of children, they, they, children like to compare themselves to one another. You know, who is faster, who is stronger, who is... Who is, who is taller? Last time in primary school, you know, ask, teachers ask you to queue up, you know, from high. Everyone kind of, they kind of like tiptoe just to look taller or whatever. We, we want to be taller, we want to be faster and all that. Remember as a, as, a, as a young child, okay, in primary school, if your teacher say, okay, let's go somewhere, let's go to the quadrangle, go to the foyer, okay, and, and uh, all make your way down there now. And you go on there, there will always be a bunch of kids that will go and there will always be those people who, there will be that, that kid or those group of kids who wants to be there first. Okay, they will kind of push, they'll kind of, you know, walk faster. And when the, if this is where your class is supposed to line up, that person will get there. And when he stands there, this kid will say, first. We, 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 we see that happening. It still happens. It's happened in history. It still happens today. It will continue to happen tomorrow. That, but there's this mindset. We want to be superior. And it, we, start the, we, we start having this when we're children. And when we grow up into adults, we still carry this as well. 
And do you know what? We see this aspect in Scripture as well. Let's take a look at the Gospel according to John, the book of John. It's very interesting. Okay, the book of John, well, every time John writes about himself, he writes about himself in the third person. He writes himself as one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, he often writes himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Okay, he always writes it in, in, in such a manner. So whenever you read the book of John, it says the other disciple, or it says the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's talking about himself. So this happens on Easter Sunday, okay, on the resurrection, okay, where, where Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and Jesus' body is not there anymore. Look at John 20, verse 2. So Mary Magdalene saw that there's no body there, no body in the, in the tomb. She ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So she calls for help. Now we look at verse 3 to 4. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, John, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. This guy writing a book, okay, right, recording this, and he records it, you know. They both ran together, but the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. It's really like those two primary school kids going right there, and then you see them trying to get there faster than the other, and the one gets there first, he says, first. That's, that's what's happening right here, okay? And you know what? If it's just a one-off thing, okay, fine. But look, how else John continues to record this? John chapter 20, verses 5 to 6. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the... Uh, this is Peter. Peter went, to the, went into the tomb, okay? When they... Uh, yeah, when they got there, Peter went into the tomb he, and he says this, stooping down, he looking in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. Sorry, this is uh, John. John did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him and went into the tomb. So Mary Magdalene went to cry for them and Peter and John ran to the tomb. Now when they get there, John says he got there first. But when he got there, he did not enter the tomb yet. He did not want to enter the tomb. Later on, Peter then arrives and when Peter arrives, Peter immediately goes inside the tomb. Then you go on and read verse 8. John chapter 20, verse 8. Then the other disciple, John, who came to the tomb first, went into the tomb also. He saw and he believed. I mean, you look at how this is written out, how John writes this, and this is clearly an important enough detail to record. And we may think, well, this is very, this is very childish. But yet, is it really very childish? Here you had this same, these are the same group of people who had a great dispute at the Last Supper, as to who should be considered among the greatest. And John wasn't the only one like that, okay? Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 33. We read the words of Peter. Peter declared to Jesus, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Listen to this phrasing here, it's very interesting. It's one thing to say, Jesus, I tell you what, no matter what happens, come what may, I will never desert you. But that's not what he said. He says, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. You know what? He must make an effort to put down other people and elevate himself. Is there really a need to that? You can just say, Jesus, I will not, I will not, I will never, never, never desert you. He could just say that. No, you know what? Even everyone else may desert you. I will never. There's, there must be this comparison right there. And that's what I mean by comparison feeds our self-centeredness. That everything actually ends up revolving around us. It gives us this, we want to have this sense of superiority. We cannot lose. We must win. Everything must revolve around me. And sometimes it ends up with us putting ourselves up on a pedestal. That's why I say it feeds this self Centeredness. Everything revolves around us. The standards, everything must revolve around what I feel and what I am or what I think it should be. And because of that, when things don't go our way, we are not feeling unfair. We feel like it's a very unfair situation. We come back to Peter, right? You know, Peter, he declared just now that he will never desert Jesus. He will never betray Jesus. But in the end, we all know Peter was the disciple who denied Jesus three times. He denied Jesus three times. And the beautiful thing is that even though he denied Jesus three times, after Peter meets Jesus after the resurrection, what does Jesus do? 
Jesus restores Peter. Okay, I won't, give, won't read through this, but if you record now, John chapter 21, verses 15 to 19, we read about the exchange between Jesus and Peter, where he restores him. Jesus asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes. Then Jesus says, feed my sheep. He does this three times. He restores him. It's a very touching, in my opinion, it's a very touching thing. Okay? Remember, when, if, you re, if you read the whole passage there, when Jesus goes up to Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? It records that Peter was very grieved by that question. It was a, very, a lot of emotions were in that conversation. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. He does that. Immediately after that, what happens? It goes all the way to verse 19 of John chapter 21. Now go and look at John chapter 21, verse 20 to 22. Immediately after that, huh? Jesus had just restored Peter. Then Peter, okay, then meaning like just immediately after that, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, means John was following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You just follow me. Interesting, huh? This very touching moment, this restoration there, okay, Peter and Jesus, they're having this moment, and Peter, you know, he's, he's probably, he's grieved, he's probably crying, you know, and Jesus restores him. It's a very touching thing. And immediately, he turns around, he sees John, and Peter feels like, well, I just gonna chewed up, I just gonna, like, scolded like that, you know? Okay, I was, something was pointed out about my life, and his immediate reaction is, Jesus, what about this guy? Was not this guy also on that night? Was he not one who deserted you as well? What about him? That was what, that's what Peter was doing. And what does Jesus say to him? Jesus says, what is it to you? What is it to you? Why does it matter to you even? What does it matter to you? What John does, what happens to John or whatever, it does not matter to you. What happens in his life is what I will it to be. That's what he's saying. It doesn't matter. Basically, it's really, it's, it's, it's really so what? It's really almost like, kind of like, what's the What's the deal? What's it to you? I mean, really, what's it to you? See, down here, it, you see Peter like almost unable to escape from this spirit of comparison. And Jesus says, Jesus is like, what is it to you? What is it to you? See, that's why I say this mindset of comparison, it feeds our self-centeredness. That we look to ourselves. Am I superior? Am I better? You know, hey, hey, how come it's not fair? Why I cannot? This other person never cannot. It's, it's a lot of focus on ourselves. And you can see in this way, Peter, just like he did at the, that night of the Last Supper, where he must put down all the other disciples to elevate himself. Right now, what he's doing again here is almost like he's putting down John, or, or rather, now that he feels small, he must drag someone down with him as well. See, because that is what happens when you have this kind of spirit of comparison that leads you to this sense of superiority. It feeds that self-centeredness within you. And when we have the spirit of comparison, it's very likely that in our lives, we're going to have, at some point in time, we will tear down someone else just so that we can either feel good about ourselves or so that we can elevate ourselves to a higher status. That's why Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. This is something we're taught in, 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 in Scripture. We are not to put ourselves on a higher position, but if anything, we should give more esteem to other people. We should not feel superior than others, but we should be seeking as to how we can build others up and not tear them down just so that we can feel good about ourselves. So that's the first thing I want to share with us today when it comes to this whole idea of comparison, okay? And I said, this is a trap. You see Peter caught in this trap. You see many people caught in this, uh, uh, in this trap. Same thing between Cain and Abel. So Cain was caught in that, in, that, in that trap also. This is all this comparison. Why is Abel favored? Why am I not favored? And, and we get caught in this trap. So that's the first thing. Comparison feeds our self-centeredness. And the more we compare, the more it's going to feed that. But there's a second thing, which I guess is an opposite. In as much as comparison feeds self-centeredness, comparison also starves us of contentment. 
It starves that sense of contentment in our lives for what God has given us, for what we already do have. And you know, when we tend to compare ourselves with other people, we compare situations with other situations, one aspect is that we have this desire for superiority, but it's another aspect is that some of us, we're caught up in a spirit of, of inferiority. We have an inferiority complex. That's the other flip side of comparison. Comparison has an aspect of being superior, it's the other aspect of being inferior. Both sides do not honour the Lord. Both ways are not how we are to live our lives. Have we all not been in that kind of position before? Where we compare ourselves to somebody else and say, you know what, ah, I can never be like that person, that person is this, 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 this. You know, that person is, is, is so good. And the more you think about it, the more you look at it, you feel insufficient, you feel inadequate, you just feel terrible about yourself. And that was basically what we see happening to Cain in Genesis chapter 4. What happened there? Cain did not prepare the best offering, not because he did not have anything good to give, but he chose not to give God the best. Abel, on the other hand, he chose to give the best crops uh, that he had, he gave it to the Lord, and he won the praise of the Lord. But right there and then, what happens to Cain? Cain falls into this comparison trap. And once you're in this trap, I call it a trap because you're stuck there. And sometimes when you're stuck, it's almost like you're an infinite loop. You cannot see out of that particular situation. So when he sees that Abel is favoured, and he's not favoured, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 5, Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. This is a very common sentiment, it's a very common emotion. It's a mixture of anger and sadness. And sometimes we tend to, to, to pinball between the two. In one moment you're angry, one moment you're sad, or some moments you're a bit sad and a bit angry at the same time. Cain was going through that. And he was responding to that situation. And, and some of us, we may feel like he has a point and a reason to feel this way. But let's think about it for a moment. Yes, God was not pleased with Cain's offering. But that's because Cain's offering came from a wrong heart in the first place. It came from a wrong heart. But despite that, notice something in verses 5 to 6. It says, Cain was very angry. His face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? What is the interesting thing here? The interesting thing here is that even though okay, he did not give the best offering, even though he had done what, is, what was not, uh, he done something that was incorrect, God never actually rejected Cain. He never pushed Cain aside and said, you know what, Cain, I don't want you anymore. Everything now has got to do with Abel. In fact, when God sees that Cain is struggling, what does God do? God draws near to Cain. God didn't push him aside. God was the one who came to him and said, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? He went to talk to Cain. But despite this, like I said, Cain, he, he fell prey to this comparison trap. He was stuck in that moment. He cannot see out of that particular situation and he just saw how he was inferior to, to, to his brother and he was pushed to this extreme limit of, of anger, I suppose, where he finally killed his brother. If you ask me, I think Cain lost sight of the big picture. He, he lost out of the big picture. He lost the plot right there. He was caught up with this sense of inferiority he had. And he didn't realize that what made him significant was not the offering that he had. What made him significant was not um, whether he was favored or not. What made him significant was this, that God, the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the lord of lords, will come near to him and talk to him. That God desires a relationship with him even when he had not done something well. That was something so special. I know uh, it was uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle who made a statement in his own sermon about comparison. He says this, the fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. Cain did have something special. What did he have? He had a relationship with the Lord Almighty. But you know what? He was caught in this comparison trap. He was trapped in it. He could not see beyond it. He fell into it and it became something extremely deadly. 
You know, as I was preparing this, I, I found myself coming back to different parts of Scripture, and I, I came back to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, and it's found in Exodus 20. You know, for, all, for a long time, okay, for many years of my life, I could never remember the Ten Commandments because I always got them confused. Okay? I always end up mixing up a few different commandments. Now, I want to read a few of them. Okay? Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. It says right there, you shall not commit adultery. Next verse, in verse 15, it says, you shall not steal. Okay? I, I, I know this, but I always get confused. But every time I knew, how come I cannot list everything? Because I always get these two things, verse 14 and 15, I get it confused with verse 17. Verse 17 says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, I always got it confused. You know why? Because I thought the commandment on adultery was, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. I thought the, the, uh, the thing about not stealing is that you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's property. And I, I, there's not always something, always some commandments are missing because I, I, I get them wrong. And I realized I don't actually understand. I didn't understand what the word covet means. And so I went to learn it, and the word covet, it is to yearn to possess something, especially something belonging to another. There's a difference in these commandments, you know. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. These are things. But this one in verse 17, this commandment here, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not covet your neighbor's property, is this, you know, basically it comes back to comparison. To covet, to yearn to possess something that someone else has, right? Why? Because you want it. You don't have it. You want that relationship that this person has with his wife or her husband. You want what you see there. You want what this family has. You want what this person has, whether it's a material possession or some other benefit or blessing this person has. We want that. We yearn for it and we covet it. And right here, that's why in the commandments, there's a distinction, okay, that talks about specifically about coveting something. Because if it, it, it reveals this sense of comparison where you feel inferior. I lack something that somebody else has and I want it. I want it so badly that I would break other commandments just so that I have it. I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of a, uh, uh, a position before where you see something that you don't have. It either makes you feel inferior or you come to this place of maybe you, maybe you wouldn't use this word covetous yeah, in that area, but you have this strong yearning for it. And this can be anything. I'm not, I'm not saying everything in the form of, oh, you're coveting your neighbor's husband or wife. I'm not saying that. But sometimes we can compare things and we yearn for something else. I've met, I've dealt with a lot of our own youth who reach a place and say, you know what? I wish I didn't have my parents. I wish I had these other parents. I wish that person was my father and mother instead. I've heard people say that. I wish, I wish, I wish that was my school. I wish, it can be anything else that we covered. And we long for that. We aim for that. But what really is the issue there is that we are being starved of our contentment. We are being starved of what we actually do have. You know, like I said just now, in this digital age, it's very easy for us to compare ourselves with one another right now. It's so easy to compare one another because we, we post things online, we share things, we have videos, and you can, and well, word of mouth gets around a lot faster than it used to. Lah. You know, and we can hear things like, hey, do you know so-and-so got this, so-and-so did that, so-and-so achieved this? And you hear all these things, it's, it gets you so easily, and you can begin to feel inferior about that. And as you feel inferior, you kind of have this longing, you want that same thing as well. I remember a couple of years ago, I, I, I met a, a friend for lunch. This friend is from the, the, the US. He's a pastor there, and he used to be in the media business, a lot of uh, publications and TV and, and everything. And at that point of time, I was just stepping into, I, I had not become senior pastor yet, but I was stepping into senior level of leadership in the church, and my dad was giving me a lot more uh, uh, runway to, to, or a lot more leeway, rather, to be running things of the church. And I remember I told him this one thing, you know, he told me, uh, I told him this, that very often nowadays, uh, I, look, I go to social media, and on social media, it's so easy to see what other churches are doing, you know, other people's ministries and everything. You can hear they, they did this program and how many hundred people got saved and they did this and whatever. And I told him that, you know, sometimes I look at it and I feel very inferior to that. You know, how come, how come I, I can't have that? 
I can't have that. I can't, I, I, I'm not seeing that where I'm at. And he cautioned me. He said, don't fall into that trap, you know. And he says, why is it really a trap? Because he says, as, I mean, him in his own experience as media, he told me, he said, Daniel, you have done some of these media things before. He says, you know this, that a lot of things that you see on social media may not necessarily be true. Okay? And, and, and he says, you know, there's a lot of things. You can put a nice picture. You can see a picture of a, of a, of a church service that's very packed. But you know what? The picture only shows you that particular angle. It doesn't show you the rest of the church that was empty. It gives you a, a snapshot of that one split second. That's all. But that one split second is enough to make you feel so insignificant and inferior. Then, and, and I mean, I said, I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. We don't really know all the different things that are, are, are going on in there. And, but that single picture, that split second or something, makes you feel so inferior. I mean, that's my own journey. I don't know about yours. It can be any other thing. It can be a classmate did this, a classmate did that, and, and suddenly it, it gets you, you know. Just a little bit gets you. When I was, um, now, when I was uh, in the second year of my national service, okay, that was at that point in time, I was, I, I took leave, I went overseas for a G12 conference in Korea with my, with my parents, and Pastor Caesar was there, and we are having some time, and that, that was the only time where Pastor Caesar spoke to my family, and he told my parents, he said, there's a calling on Daniel's life to be a pastor. And so he, he prayed for me, he set me apart. And I remember after we came back from that conference, my dad started making all these plans, you know, when I, when I ORD, when I leave the army, you know, this is going to happen. In fact, um, it was going to be said that the moment I ORD, I'm going to come on staff in, 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 in FCBC. And I remember I was quite excited for that. And before I ORD, I was talking to all my uh, uh, platoon mates and everything, just talking, you know, you just talk and say, hey, everyone, every time before you ORD, people start asking, what are you going to do next? So we just started talking. One person going overseas to study medicine, someone going to study law, someone's going to do this, someone, uh, this person had a, uh, his, his family has a big business empire kind of thing, he's going to inherit, they're going to run that kind of thing. So they all sharing all these big plans and, and, and everything. And then it came to me, and he says, Daniel, what are you going to do? And then I just, I remember I very sheepishly said, I'm going to be a pastor. And I, I remember at that moment, right, I felt so small. I felt so inferior to everybody, to everybody else. And again, right, no one intended to make me that way, feel that way. No, it was no one's plan. But just in that moment, something so small and something so, so little, just a statement like that, just a 10-minute conversation can make me feel so inferior and small. I'm sure the same goes for some of us. We have been through those moments before. And that's why I say, that's why I say comparison starves us of our contentment because comparison makes you look at what you don't have as opposed to look at what you do have instead of because you know what and, and we get caught in this trap because you cannot do anything with what you don't have you can only do things with what you actually do have so you keep looking and looking and looking you can you can never grasp it because it's, it's not it's not there you're grasping at straws you're grasping at air you're not going to go anywhere and so we must say, God, help me recalibrate my life. I cannot live with this sense of comparison because comparison starves us of our contentment. That's why I come back to the statement just now. The fastest way to kill something, rather kill something special, is to compare it to something else. Now, I know a few of us, as I was writing this, I also had my own discussion in my own head. Maybe some of us, as we're hearing this, we may be thinking this other thing though. You know, it's only through comparison that we can actually grow. When we compare ourselves to someone or something else, then we have something to aim towards. And some of you may feel that if there's no comparison, then that leads to complacency. Well, what I want to say is this. Do not confuse comparison with aspiration. Don't confuse comparison with aspiration. Com comparison is not the same thing as aspiration. What is aspiration? Aspiration is when you, you look forward towards something. You want to accomplish something. You want to achieve something. That is an aspiration. You want to be something. That is an aspiration. The lack of comparison leads to contentment. The lack of aspiration is what leads to complacency. If you want to put opposites to it, or antonym in this sense, I guess, Com on the opposite side of comparison, I would say it's contentment. Complacency is the opposite of aspiration. 
is when we have no aspiration, we're not looking forward to anything, we're not, we're not setting a goal, we're not moving towards something, that is when we end up having complacency. You see, you know why? When you compare yourself to someone else, I guarantee you, 100% of the time, you will fail. You will fail. Okay, right now, I can compare myself to Pastor Roland. You know what, again, you can let me, I can compare myself to Pastor Roland, I can try to, to be like Pastor Roland for the rest of my life, and I will always be a poor example of Pastor Roland because I am not Pastor Roland. My best efforts will not make me the best Pastor Roland because only Pastor Roland can be Pastor Roland. You see, if, if, you, if I live based on that comparison, then that is a goal I can never accomplish, I can never attain. But I can aspire to say, I want to be like him in this certain way. I, I, want, I aspire to be like this, this person. I aspire to have these, these, these traits. It's a difference between this aspiration and comparison. Craig Grosha also says this, where comparison begins, contentment ends. Like I said, it's because we're looking at what we don't have as opposed to looking at what we do have. So today, these are the two things I want to share with us on this topic of comparison. Two ways that comparison affects our lives. Number one, comparison feeds our self-centeredness. It feeds us, in this sense, this part of us that wants to be superior, where we want things to kind of revolve around us, where we see ourselves as this standard. If we have this spirit of comparison, it actually feeds it. And the longer we have this spirit of comparison, this self-centeredness will grow larger and larger and larger. At the same time, if we have this sense of comparison within us, it starves us of our contentment. And the more we compare, the less contented we are going to feel. That's why I've called this message the comparison trap. It's something we get trapped in, we get stuck in, and you know what? When you're in a trap, we must be set free. Some of us today were in this trap in that we have the perspective of superiority. That some of us, we have the aspect of self-centeredness or the aspect of pride and arrogance. We feel like, you know, I... I'm better than everyone else. I know more, you know, hey, I've been doing this, 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 I've got all this experience, you know, y'all don't know as much as I do. I've met plenty of people like that. Others were caught up in, the, in, in this comparison trap in the sense that we feel we're inferior to everything else. We keep comparing ourselves and say, oh, you know, I'll never be like that person. I'll never be like this cell, cell group leader. I'll never be like that cell member. You know, I can never be like that person, cannot win all these people, cannot find my 12. I can't do all these different things. And we keep comparing like that and we keep feeling, you know, I... I you feel this sense of inferiority. And some of us, we, we struggle so much with this inferiority that we've lost all contentment. You know what? Don't let comparison destroy what God has for you. Don't let comparison destroy that special thing that God has in store for you. Today, there's some of us, if we know, as we hear this, that, hey, we are a little bit self-centered, that we have this sense of comparison, this sense of superiority, and we've fed this self-centeredness, well, what, how can we respond to this? Well, number one, you need to humble yourself before God. We must humble ourselves before God. If we have this sense of superiority over other people, you know what? You need to learn to humble yourself before God. Not before people, before God. Because you are, that is the level of arrogance that exists when we live like that. That's why God does something very interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 to 29. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. As far as God is concerned, no one has any boasting rights. And like what he says, he chooses the things of the foolish to shame the wise. He chooses the thing of the weak to shame the strong. He, it's intentional for God. That's why I say we need to, if, if we feel that, if we have that sense of superiority, we need to humble ourselves before God. It starts from there. The second thing is this. Comparison starves contentment. If you are stuck there, you need to find your confidence in God. 
If you feel superior, you need to turn to God. If you feel inferior, you also need to turn to God. God is the one who can set us free from this. And some of us, we, we, we are so, we keep comparing ourselves to other people. Not only are we not contented, we have lost any kind of confidence within us anymore. You know, it's interesting that in 1 Timothy 4.12, what do we read about it being written of, of Timothy? It said this, you know, let no one despise your youth, but be an example for the believers in the word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Look at that strong word there. Let no one despise your youth. And when it says, let no one despise your youth, it includes you. Because sometimes we become, we are so caught up with this spirit of comparison. We are so discontented. We are, we, we've lost everything that we even despise who we are. We despise what we have. I've heard people say that they despise their family and they want that other person's family. They want, that, they want a family that looks like this and looks like that. And because of that, they despise what they do have. But today, we, we, we cannot live like that. And I think that reminder has to be given to, to Timothy and has to be given to all of us. Yes, yeah, some of you, you, you're still journeying, you're still growing, you're still learning. You may not be the best at this or that, but you, you, you cannot, let no one despise that. Of all, and of all things, you yourself do not despise that. But instead say, I want to come before God. God, help me find my confidence in you. He is the one who gives us that confidence. If you look at the, a lot of the people who are used by the Lord, I mean, I mean, now that we're going through Exodus, uh, Moses, Moses was someone who didn't want to be in a leadership position. He was someone said he cannot. He said there are other people better than him. But yet, he did what needed to be done. That confidence is not going to be found in himself. It can only be found in God. So today, I know we're all caught up in this. There, there's a lot of us that easily fall into this comparison trap. We need to be set free from that. It was this other pastor, Mark Driscoll. He says this about this time we live in. He says, we live in a culture where your wins are public and your losses are private, where your pleasures are public and your pain is private, where you share your best day on social media, but keep your worst day to yourself. And we get, we get suckered into this. Okay? On one end is that, you know, people can be less authentic than, than they ought to be. But on the other hand, we are always, in your own life, you know the highs and the lows. You know the best moments and the worst moments. And the problem is, we always compare our worst moments to other people's best moments. And you know what? There's no winning one. You will never win that. You will never win. Every, you don't see all their own uh, uh, struggles. You don't see all the behind the scenes, what goes on out, um, other than what you see on that screen there. And we need to break out of that. We need to be able to say, you know what, I look at this, it doesn't bug me. But like I said, it can be a simple post, a simple piece of news you, you hear. In that split second, it can make you feel so inferior. That's because we're caught up in this comparison trap. And today, God wants to set us free. If anything, when Jesus came here on earth, He wants to set us free from this sense of comparison. And if anything, if there's any comparison to be done at all, it's not among one another, it's not from person to person. If anything that we're supposed to compare ourselves to is to God's standard. He came to be that standard. If anything that we compare ourselves to, that's all we compare ourselves to. That we, because He says that He came to fulfill the law. We compare ourselves to this standard that He has set for us. And that's the beautiful thing. The truth is that when we live by faith, if anything, we just keep comparing ourselves to God and say that we want, we, 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 we must, we keep falling short of that, we must uh, uh, strive to be, be more and more like that. But you know what? Even though we're not, even though we're not at God's standard, God doesn't hold it against us. You know? The Bible reminds us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not that we met a certain standard, then He said, okay, you, you have accomplished this, now I die for you. No, while we were yet sinners, He died for us. In Ephesians 2.10, what does the Lord tell us? The Lord says, we are His workmanship. We are His masterpiece. So why do we feel so inferior? 
He says, you are his workmanship already. And I just want to close up, bring us to, to Hebrews chapter 12. I didn't prepare on the slides, but I just was led to, to this earlier on. Hebrews chapter 12, that reminds us, you know, verse 1 onwards, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Or another translation says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. If anyone is, if there's any standard for us to be compared to, it's Christ. And we all need to continue to look towards that. If we want to find that freedom from this comparison trap, then that's what we need to do. We need to stop comparing ourselves to other things. Stop, stop comparing your family to something else. Stop co comparing your experience to someone else's experience. Stop comparing what you have versus what someone doesn't have and all that. Stop comparing your kids to someone else's kids. Stop comparing your parents to other people's parents. Because we, we need to stop all that. And if we don't, then this trap is going to kill you. You know, most traps, you know, hunting or whatever, a bear trap, everything, the trap doesn't kill you immediately. You know? It doesn't kill the animal. The animal gets trapped there, and over time, the animal, either the hunter that comes back and kills the, the thing himself or later on, or the or the animal just starves to death. When you're stuck in that trap, you may not be dead yet. You may not, your, your spirit may still be alive, but you give it time, it's going to die out. And that's why we need to be set free from this trap. And today, I want us all to be set free from the trap. Whether you're here or you're back home, today, God wants you to be set free. And I think it's, it's so perfect that this weekend is the weekend that we're here coming to the table of the Lord because the Lord reminds us of the freedom that He has given to us. And today, if there's anyone here that you don't know Jesus, you've never responded to the gospel before, today, I want to give you an opportunity to come and respond. I want you to have this opportunity to be set free because the Word of God says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I'd like all of us to close our eyes and bow our heads, both here and at home. We're going to have a time of response. And I know that those of you online or on site here, some of you, you've never responded to the gospel before. But today, the Lord is calling out to you. The Lord is saying, this is the day of your salvation. This is the day that you can be set free. And we all know that we live in a society filled with this spirit of comparison. And the Lord wants us to know that there is now no condemnation in Christ. And I like those words because there's some of us, because of this spirit of comparison, we feel exceptionally condemned. Maybe by the world or maybe from your own thoughts. But today, the Lord wants to set you free from that. If you've never responded to the gospel, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment's time, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you've never responded to the gospel before, I want you to pray along with me. I'll say this prayer out loud and I'll say it line by line. I want you to pray out loud. I want you to say it line by line along with me as well. And I want all the Christians here and at home, I want you to pray along as well so that in this moment, we are all together. But if you've never responded to the gospel, today come and pray. Don't wait any longer. Today, come and respond. It is no coincidence that you're here. God is calling out to you. It doesn't matter how, how much you, you, you think you know about Christianity. It doesn't matter how good or bad you think you are. Today, God says, don't compare yourself to all the other people here. Don't compare yourself to, all the other, to what you think. God says, today, you are His workmanship. Come before Him. And as you respond, I know the Lord is going to do something in your life. So if our heads bow and our eyes close, I'm going to lead us in this prayer right now and I invite you to pray along with me. Just say these words. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for your great love for me. That you would send your son Jesus. That you send your son Jesus. To die for my sins. To die for my sins. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross. Today I know. Today I know. That I am set free. That I'm set free. And I know. And I know that you are my living hope. Yet you are my living hope. Because when you died on the cross, because when you died on the cross, you rose again three days later. You rose again three days later. 
today, today I open my heart to you. I open my heart to you. I declare. I declare. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my Savior. And I want to follow you. And want to follow you all the days of my life. All the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's keep our heads bowed and our eyes still closed. I know that some of us, whether you're here or you're back home, wherever it is, you pray this prayer for the first time. If that's you, here's what I'm going to do. In a moment's time, I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, the moment I say three, if you pray with me just now, I want you to say a very simple prayer. And this time, I'm not going to lead you in this prayer. I want you to say it yourself. But it's all right. I'll give you the words to say. It's a very simple prayer, just five simple words. And the words are this, God, reveal yourself to me. God, reveal yourself to me. And as you pray that, I want you to know that God hears you. See, I don't want you to think that, oh, God hears you because you, know, you pray along with the pastor and because he's a pastor, that's why God hears you. No, I want you to pray by yourself and I want you to know that God hears you. And whether it's today, tomorrow, in the coming days, you are going to experience and encounter the Lord in such a real way in your life. Because He wants you to know that He's real and He's there with you. So, if you pray with me just now for the first time, at the count of three, I want you to say this simple prayer, God, reveal yourself to me. And even if you didn't respond earlier on, but right now you know you must, you know you need to, at the count of three, you just respond as well. So I'm going to count right now. At the count of three, you say these words, God, reveal yourself to me. One, two, and three. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for every single person who responded with this prayer. And Lord, I ask that as they pray, Lord, truly they will encounter you in such a real way in their lives. Lord, I pray for them that they will know that you are always with them. And to all of you who responded, the Lord says this to you, you are not an accident. You are not inferior. Never feel like you're not good enough because God says to you, you are his masterpiece. You are his workmanship. And he has called you for a beautiful purpose ahead. So today, the Lord wants you to say that he's, He wants you to be set free. Don't live your life caught up in this trap. Today, you are set free and the Word of God tells us whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So Lord, we thank you for this. I bless all our friends who responded. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We'd we'll like to invite all of us to stand, and those of you at home as well, if it's possible for you, why don't you stand? We're going to close off this time worshipping the Lord. But I'm sure there's some of you who responded just now, and if you responded in any way, I want you to do this. I want you to head over to this website we're going to put up on the screen right now, which is uh, fcbc.org slash connect with us. We want you to get connected with us. You know why? Because as you begin this new journey, you're what we call a spiritual baby. A baby needs a family and a community to grow and journey through life, and we would like to be this spiritual family to you. So we're serious about being this, so if you responded in any way, come and get connected with us because we want to really get connected with you. And if some of you, you brought a friend, and you know they responded, help them, uh, connect with them, and make sure they do respond there so that we can make sure that uh, really we can surround them as this community. Well, as we close off this time right now, we're going to worship the Lord. And as we worship the Lord, we just need to respond. Some of us, we know that we, are, we have that certain streak of pride, of arrogance, of superiority in our lives. And because of that, it causes us to compare others to us and when they don't make it out, we kind of look down on them and everything. You know what? We need to come and repent of that. And when you say, Lord, I want to humble myself before you. There's some of us, and I, I believe this is an overwhelming number of us, that at some point, maybe right now, maybe right now you kind of feel okay, but at some point in time, you've struggled with that sense of inferiority. And you know what? Something so small, a split second, a single statement from somebody, a single social media post you've seen can make you feel so down and so low about yourself. But today the Lord is drawing near to you. He says, why are you so downcast and he wants you to lift up your head he wants you to look to him he wants you to find that confidence in him he wants you to know you are not what the world says you are you and I we are what he says we are and today he wants to set us free 
whether it is we, we, we have a lot of successes in our lives or whether we have a lot of failures in our lives, today we're going to turn back to the Lord and say, Lord, it's only through you. You know, we're going to sing this song and we sang it just now. It says, yet not I. But it, it's really, it's, whether we're, we succeed or whether we are failure, you know what? It's all through Christ. Say, Christ, come and help me. Help me journey. Help me do what I need to do. Maybe today you feel like you're a terrible cell leader. You may feel like you're a terrible Christian. You feel like you're a terrible parent, you're a terrible child, you're a terrible student. Whatever. I don't know what it is that you feel. Today the Lord says, be set free. So, if any of you online, you need prayer, put it up in a live chat. Someone will get connected with you. For the rest of us here, we're going to worship the Lord with this song. If any of you here at TC, you need prayer, I know later on we'll worship along, we'll lift up our hands, but if you need prayer, look out for one of our staff, just wave to them, they'll come alongside you and pray for you. Some of you, maybe you just ask your friends to pray for you, that's fine as well. But if you need someone to pray for you, don't, don't go through this alone. Ask someone to come alongside. That's what a family is all about. So as the worship team leads us in this song, let's come and respond. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is solely Jesus. For my life is holy bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can see all is mine.
Let's lift up our hands to the Lord. And as we close, I just want to read these words for us once again from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord, we thank you that you are our standard, you are our banner, and Lord, we look to you. We pray that we will not have our eyes fixed on what we do not have or what others have, but Lord, our eyes will be fixed on you, the author, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. And as we follow you, as we run this race that you have marked up for us, may we grow in maturity. May we find our confidence in you. May we find our, our contentment in you. And may we always walk humbly before one another. So Lord, we thank you for this time. We receive this. And if there's anyone here, I just said there's someone here, the Lord wants you to hear this again. You are his masterpiece. You are his masterpiece. I release this for you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we just put our hands together? Can we praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here with us, especially all those of you uh, at home. God bless you and have a great week ahead. We'll catch you next week. Bye-bye.